Some of you guys found out about the meetup. Uh, we did a kind of a bigger blast in terms of um, outreach this time. And um, Matt Fairchild did a lot of outreach, and so did Mark Siegel. And I don't see either of them right now. There's, there's Matt. There's Mark. Where's Mark? I don't know where Mark is. Anyway, uh, so welcome to the online community meetup. And I am Susan Tendy, and you are at TechSoup. And um, TechSoup is a nonprofit. Uh, we are in our 25th anniversary, as you can see the wall behind you. We are a nonprofit that does technology, um, basically provides technology, resources, products, information, and community to nonprofits. So we are a nonprofit ourselves, and we help nonprofits get the technology that they need to better achieve their mission. We're in 50 countries. Uh, you can learn more about TechSoup at TechSoupGlobal.org. Um, you can also go to the website, which is TechSoup.org. Uh, I am the online community and social media director um, of TechSoup, but I am also starting a new role, which is very exciting, um, for a new division of TechSoup, which we are about to launch, but we haven't yet launched, which right? you haven't really heard about it yet, um, which is Caravan Studios. And I started a Twitter account, but there isn't much there yet, but you guys can start following the Twitter account. And what Caravan Studios is going to be doing is um, basically closing access gaps with um, direct on-the-ground communities. Um, using apps for nonprofits, that's kind of the elevator speech, and I can talk more about that at the next meetup. If you have not joined the meetup.com slash OC tribe, if you, have, if you didn't join our meetup group and you found out about this some other way, then please go to meetup.com slash OC tribe and sign up. And the reason why is because it will remind you of these meetups. Uh, the next one we will have is um, at the end of February. These are monthly, general, generally monthly. Sometimes we skip one. And the next one will be at the end of February. It will be about uh, how arts organizations are using social media in innovative ways. Uh, a friend of mine um, is doing a um, has currently been doing a virtual ballet uh, over Twitter. Um, the Diablo ba Valley Ballet um, Organization. The, Diablo Valley Ballet Association or something um, is at Diablo Valley Ballet, I believe, on Twitter, and they're doing a virtual ballet, which means that um, their Twitter members are writing in choreography, songs, moves, like jeté, plié, or whatever, and um, th they're taking all the information, and they're going to actually turn it into a real ballet. So it's like a, an interactive virtual ballet, really interesting stuff. So how they're using, how arts organizations, and SFM will be on the panel, how different arts organizations are using social media in innovative ways. Um, what else do I have to tell you in terms of housekeeping notes? Housekeeping notes is that this meetup used to be a total uh, product and program of TechSoup. And now it is more, um, as it was when it started, uh, more of a volunteer run um, Project, which uh, was spearheaded by uh, a few of us, and um, I need a lot of help. So I said that last time, and there were some wonderful volunteers who stepped up, and um, I'm very open to sponsors for food and drink, to um, volunteers like Ravi at the door, and Mark, and Matt. In fact, volunteers, you can wave and say hi. Um, <laughs> Susan, and all these people. So um, we, we can only make this thing happen if you guys continue to volunteer. Uh, you guys want to email me about anything, Susan at TechSoup, 
I'm at Sue's Booth on Twitter. The hashtag for tonight is OC Tribe. And as you can see, this is a Twitter fall. And as you can see, if you go to the TechSoup tweet about it, this is the live stream. So you guys can retweet that tweet so your friends who are at home and not able to make it can watch this. Uh, or if you're really interested, you can watch it on your own iPhone, although I don't really understand how that would even work with bandwidth in here. Um, what else do I need to say? Uh, contextually, um, our moderator, um, Bill Johnston, is not able to make it tonight. He had a family emergency, so I'm stepping in as moderator. Hope you guys forgive me for not knowing the questions. Just got them. And um, with that, I want to introduce Brandy Farmer who uh, not only was the uh, pioneer of virtual worlds, but is a general online community veteran and pioneer. He's got a Wikipedia page. I don't know how many of you have Wikipedia pages. I certainly don't, but he does. And um, he's going to talk about the, um, he's going to kind of frame the conversation of today, which is about current and future state of online community. <coughs> Thank you, Susan. Sure. So I, I have tonight's only um, and the only reason I have a slide is because they don't have a whiteboard here. Uh, so I have this. Paperboard. <laughs> yeah, it won't fit. Yeah. Whiteboard and really fast growing. So, um, so my background in online communities goes back to the 1970s. I built my first, I'm going to use modern terms for these things because we didn't have modern terms for them then. I built the, my first bulletin board or forum software in 1975. I added chat to it in 1976, so uh, I haven't seen this particular set of combinations except twice since then. Once is in a product called The Well, and then again in Facebook, where you could both leave messages that uh, people could pick up later and actually chat with them like they were online in real time. In fact, I like Facebook's implementation. It close, closely matches mine, which was you could leave a message if they were online, you could interact with them immediately, otherwise it would just drop into the archive and keep. Um, so I've been around the entire period. I dedicated my entire career it, to the idea that computers and networks, again, I'm using modern technology terminology, uh, could facilitate human-to-human -human interaction. In the 70s, we thought computers were computing, which meant doing numbers, crunching numbers, figuring stuff out, what we would eventually call spreadsheets. Um, and up until then, trajectories and things like that. Um, but I had seen the hope, even in text-based only games, that we could do some really fun stuff. And then, more importantly, I figured out a way uh, on a computer that didn't allow people to play multiplayer real-time games and make a multiplayer Star Trek game, uh, nine people could bring an entire computer to its knees, um, but they would play across various high schools. So I've been doing, uh, my entire career has been dedicated to humans interacting with each other, sometimes for entertainment purposes, and other times for purely business purposes, and I found out they're all pretty much the same. The only difference is who's paying the bills. And that figures a lot into what I wanted to talk about briefly, uh, which is I want to present a context for online communities. Since I've been dedicated to it for my entire career now, 37 or 8 years, um, uh, will be 40 too soon, I wanted to talk about what I've, the changes I've seen uh, in the kinds of platforms for community, and specifically how the technology has adapted as more and more people came online as we scaled this thing. Um, uh, but more importantly, how community itself has changed as a result. There's this kind of symbiosis between the number of people who are online trying to interact with each other simultaneously and the technology they're using to do it um, and what that meant in terms of community management. For, so before all of this stuff is something called the phone line. So I didn't start with that. Um, but the interesting thing about form line is there were really only two patterns for the phone line uh, in the 60s to 70s. One was you call a person point to point and talk to them. Didn't need any moderation, you could always just hang up. All the moderation techniques were social. There was no technology unless you got harassed and then you call the phone company and they could shut someone's phone off. So there was permaban and that was about it. Um, it you appealed to the mods, it was a permaban. Um, if there, and, it, and because of the nature of how technology had worked, although they started moving away from that in the 40s and 50s, the way the technology worked is you had something called party line. So you could actually do small group conversations, uh, although they weren't really set up for billing for that, uh, because you're actually sharing a wire. Right? So it's like having multiple phone sets. It's exactly the same as having extensions in your house, except the extensions were in other people's houses. Um, 
Uh, and those started to have early moderation problems. Uh, that's why they moved away from it into the 70s, and it was almost impossible to get what we now call a party, or what they call the party line. So as we moved into online technologies, the, what I've got here is this graph, which represents two things, uh, kind of a, a vague sense of immediacy of response. So the things at the top are what we call real time. The things at the bottom are kind of store and forward, if you describe them in terms of technology. Uh, so we range from chat, which is the most resembles the telephone line, the idea that you would get in, you could type messages and other people would see them. Uh, this includes implementations such as IRC and other things. Um, all the way down here, we go through email, where you have this fairly responsive mechanism where you send a message. You could get a reply in minutes um, or hours, uh, depending upon you know how where the technology was at the time. Um, all the way down to what I'll call now BBSs and something called the Usenet. And I call it the Usenet special because uh, it was this interesting cooperative thing. These were all built on those same phone lines. The reason I mentioned the phone line is that was fundamentally how the network worked. If you were going to communicate um, anything outside of academia or military, it was going to go over a phone line. It was going to be batched up in a little bit of software and shipped off. And Usenet was um, our best bulletin boards of the day, mostly hosted in the military installations and, and, and universities. Oh, great. Now my someone wiggle my laptop and think can get rid of that stupid thing. I, so this means I have to talk really fast to my slide, which is great. Can you click that? OK, so. OK, thank you. Like, um, so there were early bulletin boards, like I told you, I built one, but there were numerous ones that were built usually at educational and entertainment, I mean at uh, uh, non-profit organizations kind of built them because they wanted to leave messages. They were, it, it was bulletin board because it had that same model. The model was write something to be stored and other people will come along and read it later. That's why we got the term. Um, it, not so much like forum software today, which has all these other features, it, although it does that, it also will alert people and send messages. And things like that. So there's an evolution over time. Each one of these kind of gained features. And the point I want to make here about this first column is the interaction was between one and few, sometimes one and one, but never more than a half dozen or a dozen or so, because the network was just smaller. There were only thousands of people total um, who were potentially in your audience, and by the way, once you reduce that base, who were interested in your topic, and by the way, who had technology to access it, um, your typical community size was 10, right? So there's all kinds of things you could count on. Most importantly is uh, the community moderation technique was just like I said with the phone, it was social. You behaved because people would call you out for misbehaving, right? Um, there was something, an entire thing, the reason that Usenet is one of the few actual communities being called out here specifically is because it actually evolved a social set of standards called netiquette. I don't know if you've heard of it, uh, but you should re really be interested in that. They were literally trying to impose rules upon themselves by social enforcement because there was, in fact, no central moderator for Usenet. People just added to the pile of stuff, and it got forwarded that night to the computers it knew about, and it would just get forwarded along every night. So we had this completely distributed community. It looks a lot like a forum, but it's not centrally hosted. and doesn't have central moderation at all. When you're small, this is possible. You might not be able to make this out, but I wanted to talk a little bit about this red line connecting Usenet to network forums. As we move towards what we think of internet forums today, um, this is where things started to break, when the number of people you were interacting with goes to many. The fundamental change of it's a social interaction, now we needed some mechanics, some mechanisms for dealing with people, what we would now call the technology of ban. An um, interesting ha thing happened, something called the uh, Long September, in uh, September of 1984, um, Usenet got carried on America Online. Right, so we have this technology, that's delivered not to, to universities and people who are opting into a network of share and share alike where I get the data and then I'll forward it to the nearby computers so that we have this distributed community. It's now going to the land of, of teenagers who don't care how they act. Um, Usenet died that day. If you ask anyone, they'll all tell you that we were around at that time. That's when Usenet became unusable because guess what? The people who worked for a, uh, played on AOL were completely within what AOL wanted their behavior standards to be, and those behavior standards were nothing like Medicaid. Right? And so what we've got is this massive clash of cultures. Um, 
I don't want to talk about that too much more, except to point out that every time you get these thresholds where you change the nature of interaction, community management changes its nature of being. Now, lots of network forums exist, literally millions. When I was at Yahoo as the, their strategic community strategy advisor uh, for about four or five years, I looked at literally thousands of Yahoo groups. Um, the thing I learned about network forums like that, specifically groups, which kind of live here between email and network forum, because mailing lists. Email goes from point to point to mailing lists. Groups and, and forums kind of mush together here in the middle. Um, you now had, you could scale a little bit by saying, well, if I make a group or a forum that has hundreds or thousands of users, I can manage it. Or me and a bunch of other people can manage it. So community management kind of comes into blue. Now this, we classically think of online community managers coming into existence. We've got little communities in different places, different sizes, and we now have this problem of how do we get these people who don't know anything about interacting online to behave appropriately online. And we have thousands and thousands of separate rules about how they interact. But that's okay because we have someone managing. In the case of Yahoo Groups, in fact, the person who creates it is that person by default. Uh, and they rule with an iron fist or they don't, and hopefully they boot something. But I'm not going to recount the entire history of community management for you here. Uh, just to say, there were different communities had different standards. Uh, whether or not you learned through email had a huge effect. Um, one of my favorite stories to tell about working at Yahoo was um, whenever we would interview people for Odo. Did I lose my battery? Uh, I'll talk to it anyway. I think we ran out of battery. I took too long. Um, I have a power supply. Don't worry about it. I'll talk to it anyway. Um, you can all have a slide later if you really care. Uh, uh, um, so uh, we would ask people in the Yahoo because we want to do product studies and we'd interview them. We'd ask them, uh, without a doubt, one of the followers is if you use Yahoo groups or more interested in how you do than if you don't. We'd ask people over and over and they'd all say, no, I don't use Yahoo groups. And as part of the survey, we also asked, can we look in your mailbox at the last, just the titles of the messages and the addresses for the last few weeks? And they'd all say yes. And we'd look, and sure enough, there were mailing lists in there from Yahoo groups all over the place. Mm -hmm. right. There's this interesting transformation about the difference, and this is why I don't list too much about the specifics of the technology. There's a difference between a member thinking they're in a community and the technology it's hosted on. They'd say, oh, we'd say, you're a, you use Yahoo groups. They go, oh, well, I never go to the website. I just use this mailing thing, mail, mail my friends. It's like, did you set it up? Well, no, so they didn't know what it was either. Um, along the chat line on the top, and the reason I wanted to cover the real-time stuff is there's, there was a sense for a while during that period that kind of real-time has fallen into disarray. We had virtual worlds come out of it. Uh, that's great, but honestly, they've never, even the most successful one, Second Life, it, you know, is just barely surviving by compared to anything like a face, any Facebook gaming company. So people here work for them that are doing better than Second Life is doing. They, Second Life existed for a long time comparatively. Um, there's this interesting transition that I wanted to cover um, on real time. So we had real time chat, we had instant messaging, we had virtual worlds, and I had another one up there, which is escaping. You remember what was it? No, but it's just it doesn't matter. It, 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 does, it doesn't matter. Um, the point I want to make is, is for a while, real time has fallen out of of favor. Um, it was kind of equally treated with everything else, but you know, it's actually hard to get people together in real time to do things. And in fact, the reason social gaming companies exist today and are so successful is fundamentally acknowledging that fact. That if I want to play words with friends with one of my friends, having them to have to be on right now is too high a barrier. So they perfect this interesting hybrid. It's kind of the email hybrid. It's kind of as interactive as email, but not as interactive as real-time chat. They go, well, what we're going to do is you're going to take turns, and they can be as real-time as they are allowed, as the person will allow it to be, but we're going to send notifications. And this is where things fundamentally change again. Community now gets turned on its head one more time, because now people are interacting on this line through social gaming is a kind of ar archetypal example um, in small groups. So we went from one to a few because there were only a few, to one too many, and online communities had scaling limits. That it's really hard to find a self-sustaining online message board who has more than a 
few hundred active users, and out of that, you know, 10,000 registered semi-active users, um, it's because there's a real social limit. And another magic thing that's happened is by making the social graph, my friends and the people I specifically want to be connected to, whether it's LinkedIn isn't my friends, it's my coworkers and my, my peers, um, those social graphs scale us back down again. Now we're back in that smaller size, which is a manageable community. Um, now what's interesting is the moderators, if the groups are really small, like families, again, social pressure comes back, so social wins. Um, one of the reasons social graphs work so well is if they're actually socially connected and my son misbehaves on the social graph playing some game, I go cut that crap out, just like at the beginning. Um, but if it's more broadly connected, connected around a, like a hashtag or something else, um, once again, you need that community manager back in, but now the context is very tight. Um, so we go from, I had one to, uh, one to few, one to many, and now one to friends, one to growth. Um, so these are the kinds of, as the network scale, when only hundreds of people are on the net or thousands of people are on the net, one thing worked. And when literally hundreds or you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people were on the net, that's when our heyday of the early community management stuff started. Um, and now we're at the point where billions, literally order billion users are on the net. Order billion are on Facebook. Can you imagine trying to run a real forum on Facebook? In fact, they've tried launching groups. They've actually not done very well. There's a reason. It's because they're not the right grouping unit at this scale anymore. The right grouping unit that's working for them, the successful work grouping unit, is their friends graphs. And now this graph search they're implementing, if you haven't seen it, y'all got to Everyone in this room, if you're a community manager, you all should be signed up for the graph search beta. Yeah, as long as everyone's signed up. I'm just saying, you get everyone signed up. Um, because you want to understand how this pulls groups together. Right? Um, is there contextual groups? Someone was talking to me before this about tags. Are there contextual around tags? I don't think so, but there might be an interesting intersection of some social graph and those tags. Very person asked about that, by the way, is Mark. Um, who uh, makes some really cool tools associated with tag search. Um, Mark, which can you make? Mark <laughs> Smith, he's right here. Okay. Okay. I can move there. Um, so that's mostly, uh, there's another path along the bottom, but rather than take up too much more time, uh, I wanted to kind of share a context. So when we start talking about the different kinds of communities we were after, we realize there's different sizes and different, different contexts for them. It used to be just size was enough, but now sometimes our context is literally a chunk of a graph, uh, and sometimes that chunk of a graph needs a moderator, and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so uh, I was just trying to set up kind of the space that we live in and how we got here. Uh, I'm willing to take a couple questions before we move on to the panel. Sure, sure. that's fine. And I just wanted to tell everyone, in case you can't see, because this print's kind of small up there, that Scott um, tweeted where the slide is located, and um, I just- yeah. Oh, there it is. So. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the, um, in, if you're following yeah. the hashtag OC Tribe, a couple of us have, have retweeted the location, so you can retweet that and favorite that tweet so you can see it later. Cool. And this is, uh, this is the, the bubble I didn't talk about, which is blogs, wikis, and sharing. Um, I, I'm going to take a second on this, because okay. this is worth it. So two, two things surprised me. So I've been in the industry the whole time. Uh, one of them was the evolution of blogs. If you look at the history of network forums, um, we should have seen it coming. So the problem is these are getting too big. Usenet failed because they got absorbed by AOL. It's not their fault, it's AOL eating them. Um, so these people were experts. They had no place to talk. They didn't like, they went to mailing lists at first, but they found out they were only talking to themselves and they actually wanted to talk to more people. That failed. I, I, I know this because I literally asked people about this as I went along at conferences. I said, how many people are using mailing lists who are doing this? Um, an interesting thing happened, if you take the technology that underlies network forms and you change exactly one thing, it turns into a new technology as a new name. And that is if you change the moderation pattern from there's a moderator over a bunch of topics or a set of moderators to there's one person, they create all the topics and they moderate all the responses. We call that a web blog. It's literally the same technology. It is threads with a topic head and the responses posted in reverse, uh, in, uh, the threads in reverse chronological order with the responses posted in chronological order. Same technology, new name, fundamental shift. Why did it happen? People, the, it wasn't scaling well. The community wasn't scaling well. I wanted to say something. 
I wanted control over where the conversation went. The alternative was Wiki, which is the opposite. That said, you know what, it's not scaling well. There's not a chance any community manager is going to keep up with all the content we want to get. Give up. The context will be trusted. The, po the posters are responsible for moderating this space. Now, admittedly, people added things into Wikipedia, but the, the high order bit is to say it didn't scale well to have one or two people spending all the time tracking all this content. It got in the way. If you waited to post, nothing got posted in time. And if you did it afterwards, it was always a disaster. Because only people who could make changes were the moderators. Change the rules. Say, everyone can post, and you can overpost other people's stuff, and let them sort it out. And uh, this slide is actually on a wiki called Octar Wiki. Um, now, I actually have access control to that, but anyone who wants a password can have one. Um, so, uh, just another example of how scaling changes the technology and the technology changes the community management path. So, that's it. Okay, so I want to um, just introduce, um, I'm just going to introduce the other panelists, and again, um, you know, I'm just going to let them have a conversation and kind of just sit um, on the side and let you guys ask them questions. I don't, I just have a bunch of questions, but I'm sure that they have a lot to say to each other. So Bill Johnson, as you can see, poor guy, not here, but was supposed to be the moderator. Uh, Maria from Agneva from Yammer um, is right there, and she's the Maria on Twitter, and every list of her handle is written up there. Uh, she is the director of community at Yammer. Uh, Scott Moore here, uh, formerly of the Schwab Foundation, uh, and currently um, consulting, community consulting strategist guy, um, also worked at um, Wiki Answers. Is that what it's called? Yeah, Answers.com. Yeah. Answers.com. But it wasn't it the same as Wiki Answers? Yes. Yes. And he's uh, at Scott Moore. Um, and um, Gail decided to jump in and ask him to fill up. Uh, and she's from the well. So bring, I think I can pull yeah, yeah, uh, uh, But she's um, the original kind of um, salon.com community manager. And um, anything else I should say about your title? Or anything no. else like you're consulting right now? That's plenty. OK. <laughs> and I'm going to give you guys, um, I think I'm going to give you guys the wireless to pass back and forth because it'll be easier. Um, and I'm just going to start off with some questions. And I'm also going to just let you guys ask some questions if you want, because we don't really have a format. Um, I'm looking at his questions, and some of them I'm going to skip. But um, I'm, I'm interested to know, um, huh, OK. Yeah, I, I'm interested to know how all of you, and I mean briefly, how all of you guys ended up working in online community. Well, I guess I'll start because I'm holding the virtual um, microphone. I really felt like I fell into it, and it actually actually felt like I fell into it. I got involved as a as a customer, a user at the well back in 1990, and this was before the internet was commercialized and it was all text service. And you'd log on, and there were all these strange things going on in text, and obviously these colorful personalities, and it just was something to explore. And after a, about a year of obsessively participating, a job opening came up, and I sent it out to uh, Cliff, uh, Cliff Badala, who was the manager and director. And I couldn't see the reason why he wouldn't hire me. And I was actually somewhat surprised that he uh, wanted to interview other people. I, I had such a, I was so certain that this was going to work out, and it did. I think a lot of us. I think a lot of us actually fell in in that in a very similar way. <laughs> Maria. Hi, uh, my name is Maria, and I work in Hammer, and not to be that original, but I also fell into it <laughs> um, sort of by accident. I actually sort of what was this right? Yeah, we're going to switch that one. We'll get we'll get we'll get this worked out. Just keep seeing up. spots. Yeah. Um, and I. I I guess I sort of fell into communities uh, through the offline channel. So I was in New York right around the time that meetup.com was getting formed. Um, and I sort of came there. I didn't know too many people. And I was like, well, I sort of have to meet people. How do I do that? And so I fell into that and um, started to hang with people who were in communities, got interested in it. I uh, started taking like random little jobs, consulting jobs, doing it for free. And, and then you know, this is like my third job doing it. So. And uh, where did you work before here? Um, so right before, I was uh, at a small startup called Nimble. And right before that, I was at a company called Intensity. 
So they're all um, enterprise products. So I guess my sort of specialty is customer communities for in the enterprise space, like UV business. So um, I'm not sure if I fell into it. I guess I did. It caught up with me, really. So I uh, I had a friend who was working with a virtual world in 1995 that was uh, based on software that was started by Randy Farmer and Chip Morningstar. Yay. And uh, Randy actually had finished the contract before I, I signed up. Um, and so my take on it was I thought I was joining this large kind of live role playing or online role playing thing before it really kind of these things existed. And it turned out to be um, it was a full fledged community and there was nothing. There was there was uh, the technology was there but there was no community when we started. So we actually carried it through pre uh, through beta through pre beta through beta and then started letting people in. And uh, at that point, I think that's when I fell into it because at that point, I was running to keep up with what was going on with all of the people who were coming in and doing what, what they wanted to with uh, with this virtual world. And it was amazing, it was it was great. And it, it triggered a whole bunch of things which I could go into a longer story about why I became an engineer originally. Um, but, uh, but it was just watching people take something that we had created and then turn it around and do things that we didn't expect. That was the, the hook for me. And, and I'm the only one who didn't follow it because it didn't exist yet. Um, but there are two things uh, to, to call out. Um, so the first two things I made was that message board I told you about, message forward chat. Um, but I learned about community moderation there, what it would be in the future. Um, when I was called by one of the students in the class, I was since high school, so it was, um, can someone who knows about the lights go and deal with that? Does someone know about that? You have to, Susan, you know, right? No, it's not the question. It's time. I work here. But I'll go there. I'll let you continue. Oh, uh, and uh, so. Uh, Train the, someone. So how I learned about um, online community from that, what would become the community manager, is when um, I, I was young, I was a little brash. You think I might be a little outspoken now. Let's just say I was more outspoken and louder then. Um, and uh, one of my users in the same high school, a guy, a freshman, I was a junior at the time, um, compared me to the consistency of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and then quoted Star Trek to me, called me a, a, a dictator, a, a, a tin-plated dictator, visions of God, but I think is what he called me. So I, I, was, I received the first flame ever. Um, <laughs> and, and it takes a while, but I, I, got, I got called it in 1976. Uh, and uh, and I, I, I immediately realized that was part of what drove me is, is the visceral and strong response I had to that told me we're on something. And there was one other thing which I didn't mention was I made a multiplayer Star Trek game, which was text only and it was 3D. That was hard because it just typed out coordinates and stuff and you had to kind of do it all in your head. Wow. Um, and had hidden information and everything else. Um, and I found out there that you know, they had photon torpedoes and cloaked and screens and plasmas and all those things. But it turned out the most powerful command, we played this between high schools, was not any of those commands. It wasn't whether I had shields or phasers and torpedoes. It was how do you use the communications command? Because you spend a lot of time in real time just sitting there waiting for your ship to get to the enemy space or waiting for the enemies to come to you. Um, and so you had nothing to do. So they would type at each other. And so they would quote things like Klingon spark and airlocks to each other. Or, but more importantly, they would make alliances. They'd say, let's team up. So it was a three-sided war. So let's team up. And you'd, be, you'd have betrayals, and you'd have people calling each other names. And this was the real game. Right? The reason we wanted to get together afterwards, we all drive, the seniors would all drive to one pizza joint, and we'd all come from the schools and debrief, was because of the stuff we said to each other. Right? And so that's how I fell into it. And I knew there was something here. I know it's obvious now. But at this time, it just, none of that stuff had ever happened before. So you're talking about alliances, and that kind yeah. of um, that's an interesting lead-in to the next question. And I'm not going to necessarily follow those questions. I know Bill's watching on the live stream, but I'll, I'll refer to them, Bill. Um, anyway, so the, the question I, ha I have is, um, you, you, you think about like alliances, and you think about ambassadors, and these are kind of terms that we, who are community managers, use and know today. So, how has the field of community ma management evolved, in your opinion, like let's say in the past five to ten years, and um, how has like there's been new kind of 
there have been new conventions in what is best practice and things that are totally different than they used to be. Anyone? And you don't all have to take it. You can. No, so I'm, I'm going yeah. to I'm going to pass. I don't run communities anymore. Okay. Nor do I manage people who do it. So okay. I'll pass. So I'll take a first shot at that. Um, I think one of the one of the biggest things is in the in the in, throughout the last ten years uh, has been a maturity in thinking about communities and also. Um, more of veering towards a more of a science aspect of it. Before it was a messy art. It was uh, you, nobody knew exactly what was going on. People who were doing it were not trained sociologists or psychologists, or you know, it's very rare to find somebody like that. We actually had somebody on our team who was, and um, and it uh, and so there was a lot of fumbling and a lot of trying to figure things out. Um, and I think that in the last. Definitely in the last five years, but in the last 10 years, be saying we're going to measure this. What does a successful community look like? Um, what does this, and I think it's matured even further in the past five years of what does a successful community look like for you? Because the recognition that different communities will have different successes, and what does that mean? Um, I think in the last five years, also the split between um, kind of a performance of success metric and a health metric. The idea of what makes a what makes a healthy community, it could be a healthy community, but it might not be helping a particular organization with their goals, mm -hmm. or they may not be achieving, they may be having their own goal set. And I think a lot of that became much much more mature, and I, I think it's going to continue further. Um, I think that that was it was just so like such a perfect answer to that question. And um, I'm gonna. It's. I realize it's like impossible to live tweet and take notes and moderate. So I'm gonna alternate between the two. But I'm gonna let you answer the, um, to your to your point as well. But um, Scott, that was a really interesting and perfect answer to that. Yeah. So um, I definitely agree that it's it's become more mainstream and more businesses are actually using communities as a means to connect uh, with their customers. Also, a thing that I'm seeing a lot of, and I sort of have a bias view because I work at Yammer. But there's this emergence of internal communities that happens at companies. And and I, I think we're sort of at this place where the definition of community is starting to change. Like, it could be anything. It could be your affinity group. It can be your uh, customers. It can be your uh, partners. Like, anyone. Um, and so I, I sort of see that as a, as a in, in business. So that's really my sweet spot. That's, that's what I see. Um, also, a trend. So I haven't been doing this as long, and so I don't know as much as the other folks in this panel. Uh, but in the past you know, few years, uh, to I think to the chagrin of Homo Solis, um, there is a lot of confusion about what community management is. And so uh, the social media marketing, we were just talking about this a few minutes ago, gets conflated with community management all the time. And it really hurts our profession. And so. Uh, whenever I can personally, because a lot of our customers are sort of struggling. Like a lot of these community managers sort of get handed these jobs and they don't know what they're doing. So I sort of feel like, you know, raising the literacy level is, is uh, an effort. And uh, yeah, I mean, when people sort of talk about, oh yeah, this person just tweets, that's not community management. You can use Twitter, you can use social tools to build community. But Twitter, a community is not. That's exactly right. So I do think that, that I've got to agree that uh, the scientific understanding has been a huge jump forward. And, and, and Mark Smith, who's in the room tonight, is actually one of the people who, um, over the years, has done amazing things to graph and make visible the way people are behaving in a way that you never ever could do just by trying to read through and think, you know, who's naughty, who's nice, or whatever the original management point of view might have been. Um, in the last year, uh, there was a period while I was uh, at Salon.com and uh, I was managing the responses to articles there. Um, we had some technical challenges and it was, uh, it was very hard to search through and find stuff. And so it was really complaint driven and that was really interesting. It was all responding to complaints about trolls and it was like completely different than any other community interaction I've ever been part of. So I of course did not like that from my job particularly much. 
But I learned even on that side of it, even when you have a large group of people um, whose only interaction with management and moderation is to, you know, rats, rat, you know, call the cops for better or worse. You know, sometimes it's exactly the right thing to do, and sometimes it's a little odd. Uh, I really got a feeling for the range of things that people do, and it is remarkable. And I think, uh, I think a lucky site, maybe not, maybe not necessarily a healthy site or a profitable site, but a, a lucky site in terms of um, the the community experience and the manager's experience is a place where things can change, where that site can change, whatever whether it's technology or rules or whatever structure is needed to address. Imbalances, and so to me, the the really exciting things are being able to see what's going on, and being able to do something about it. And that, strangely enough, those are not always common. I, I want to I want to um, chime in on that, and just um, I'd like to hear. I, I think that's really that's a great definition of a healthy community. And I'd like to hear from the rest of you what you think a healthy versus a successful community looks like. All right, so I want to finish with the thing there. Um, it's connected. Where she was going, it connects, it goes there. Um, and that is one of the things that's changed recently, uh, especially the last five years, um, is an acknowledgement that these communities are getting too large mm -hmm. to moderate, mm -hmm. and therefore developing new generations of tools to help with it. So I was involved, for example, in Yahoo Answers, implementing a user-empowered um, system, which basically used flags and reputation to get rid of trolls. We killed trolls in a week at the largest QA site on the internet. And the, the reason, the way we did it was we let users flag content, and if they were reliable, we hit it. So the troll would post something, hoping it would appear on the Yahoo Answers homepage, and within 30 seconds it would be gone because the users moderated their way. There was no way for a million dollars worth of uh, paid moderators to get rid of it that fast. It took actually 18 hours, which by the way meant it never disappeared effectively. Um, so there's an evolution of tools and I'm involved with a project uh, with Jeff Atwood, the guy who created Stack Exchange, uh -huh. Stack Overflow. Yeah. Um, you can expect a major announcement in two weeks of an open source platform that takes it to, to more levels. So there have been technology changes, acknowledgments that this stuff has changed and some of this stuff has been slow to change. Message boards have been too slow to change. Um, <laughs> That's changing. So there's a lot of change in one sense. Um, so what was your question again? Because I'll go ahead. And uh, my question is, is kind of um, to Gail's point and to Scott's point about a healthy community. And they were, um, well, Scott specifically was differentiating, just making a distinction between successful versus healthy. And you kind of did as well. And I just, I, I'd like you guys just to talk to what you think is a healthy community and how that might be different than a successful community. So healthy is contextual, but in lieu of not having a contest, um, basically, uh, response, the, the, the metrics are pretty straightforward. You already know what they are. They are um, uh, message response rate. If you're a QA site, how many things are answered and how many things are flagged. So it depends on the, on the uh, where you're in good shape is when your health metrics overlap with your success metrics. Mm -hmm. So I also did consulting for answers.com, it was wiki answers. And you know their metrics are very straightforward. You know, how many questions did we get? How many people were answered? And how good were they? Uh -huh. Right. They never really solved number three, whereas Yahoo Answers did a better job of getting rid of crap. But, um, but you know, if you can line them up exactly like that, so it's hard to tell with a, like in a message for technology. I I don't know what's successful other than what kind of response rate are people participating. In. When I look at Yahoo Groups, um, we did a study. We were trying to figure out. We're going to change Yahoo Groups. There were three different plans as well as they changed them, and Yahoo never developed the courage to actually implement any of them. But we did do research, and we broke, we looked at all uh, 60,000 Yahoo Group samples, um, and we looked at all these different metrics across them, and we did cluster analysis, and we came up with 320 clusters um, by, based on use patterns. Uh, and we went, well, that's too many. We can't actually get our heads around that. So we did two orders of magnitude, factor reduction, and got it down to 30. Um, and you can look at each one of the clusters and you go, well, these two things really don't go together in this cluster. So uh, the problem is, is we were looking at things we thought were health metrics. And we were trying to do things like find a bad group, find groups that should be recycled or whatever, or find a good group. You couldn't find one. Uh, because there are groups, for example, in young groups, where it's okay that no messages happen for a year. Mm -hmm. 
and the membership doesn't change. And then something happens where we put a flurry of activity, and then they'll go quiet again. That is a healthy group for those people. But by any measure that Yahoo would put as a general measure, it would look like a dead group. And it's like, okay, so we can't we can't use average run over time. We have to look at intensity. So um, I, I caution non-contextual, but it's always going to be tied around: is this providing utility for the people who are are, are in it, um, even if it's not doing utility? There are other groups. Another extreme in that group was the meetup group, the equivalent of what's a meetup group that was formed for a single thing. I ended up joining a group which is a line party for the Lord of the Rings third movie. Um, all the people in the Bay Area who heard about it joined this thing because we were all kind of disgusted. We're going to go in costume and everything else. We were supposed to all upload pictures. No one did. And the group died the day after. And that was a successful group. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to, to me, a healthy community is one where it starts to run itself and that you just kind of come in. You might give them a, a, a speaker once in a while. But like the second life community that I want is a healthy community. It might not be successful. In, I mean, it's contextual for sure, but like it's had the same it's had the same amount of it hasn't really grown but 50 people show up every week and have for like seven years and the number never gets smaller and they are totally self-run and i just like pay the tier that's it so to me that's a healthy community it's it, they, the volunteers take over and feel really passionate about it so scott so yeah so I, my response to that would be um that uh uh, while you may not be participating, while you may not be maintaining that community, the community, the, there are some, there are people who are leaders in that community. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that's so true. I think that, yeah. Um, what I would, so I, I, I did off of Randy, and, I, and I'm going to do it a little bit differently. Uh, so I, I would describe it as, as vitality, um, as Randy said, response rate. Um, I think also I take it from a look, uh, from perspective of, of culture creation and continuation. Um, uh, if you take the idea of kind of a cultural Darwinism in that what how people interact with each other and what are the rules and what are the accepted norms and what are taboos um, carry over what survives is what helps the next generation you know to continue on and so uh, in that so if you want to look at kind of a metric one of the things I look at is uh, what's the mix of of new people coming in versus uh, or group. Um, and, and again, I think Randy's point about uh, context is very important. You can have only core people and no new people and still have a successful community, or I'm sorry, rather a healthy community. Um, but I think if you're looking at something in the context of an open space where uh, anyone could come in and, and participate, um, having a core group of people, even if that uh, expands and contracts over time, they carry on what the overall ideals of the community. So I mean, it's it's an oral history because very often the written history doesn't doesn't stick or it doesn't matter. Um, even though you have you can have years and years of message board, but when somebody new comes in and somebody gets welcomed and says, "Hey, this is what we're about," that carries on. If you if you do, if you have a lot of new people and you have a lot of new churn, then it's very difficult to get that culture together. Mm -hmm. um, and you can look at even things like, I, I think the most extreme example of, of rotating people in would be the 4chan boards. Um, and you can go into the anonymous board, or wait, the B board, random board, which probably has a huge amount of churn. It's not safe for work, by the way. Um, it's not safe for cold summer <laughs> um, It's generally unsafe. But there is a, there is a, a culture that carries on from one, kind of one season to the next season. Um, so that's one of the things that I would say looking at. What I also tend to, to champion is it, when I look, when I'm trying to work on communities, my ultimate goal is to build trusted relation, help people build trusted relationships with each other. And there, that's a way loaded, and I can unpack that for about half an hour. So, but it's build, helping other people build trusted relationships with each other. It's whatever you do that you think that's going to help somebody do that, that's what you should do. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's really what a community, to me, what a community um, is and how it's different from social media marketing is that it's it's about the connections between the members and it's about that mind trust and that it's, it's the artifacts um, that these community members have, are creating together and have created through the years and as members rotate, uh, like these guys mentioned, the history stays and the culture stays. And um, I think, I also think successful communities are a subset of healthy 
I don't think you can have a successful com uh, community that's not healthy. Mm -hmm. um, even if like it's a commercial community like the one that I run is, um, I wouldn't think it was successful in meeting my company's needs if it wasn't healthy, if people were not talking to each other, if, if it was not organized around sort of a higher idea. And so like, for example, we're, we're Yammer, so, but I, I'm very careful about making sure that it's not just about Yammer, that we're talking about the reason why, sort of like what do people actually want? How do they see themselves as pioneers on the forefront of changing the future of work, right? So I think a higher purpose and, and a collective passion for delivering that purpose, I think that's what a healthy community also needs. There's a lot of really active commenting communities that I wouldn't say are necessarily healthy and that don't really connect users with each other. Um, really high profile publications, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to be tweeted. But um, there are certain... I, really I was going to say I would love to hear Justin Esau's take on this. Okay, so that's where I was going with that, but I, I, don't want to be, I don't want to be talking about that publication right. on any kind of media. But anyway, um, so... The, um, but that's true, right? To, one of the, do you want to just talk to a minute from, from your perspective on that? No, so I don't know if you knew exactly what I was about to say. I didn't say that. Right, so, so, Susan, so Susan doesn't want to say it, I'll say it. So uh, 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 Justin Isef, uh was the uh, community manager, director, director uh, for Huffington Post. Um, and they handle a million? Seven million users a day. Oh, but not users? There's oh, 7 million comments. Comments a day. So what she was referring to was it's a very active commenting uh, space, but I think it would be really interesting to hear his perspective, and I'm sure we can find him. I'm sure we can find him and, uh, at some point and ask him what uh, uh, what he thinks what he thinks was going on as far as community within that. Because I'm sure that there are regulars. They do have, they do have a, they, I mean, you have profiles, you have, you have the bits there. Um, you have you have profiles. You have a very rudimentary reputation type system. They and they have a, a commenting system called Julia, which is a hybrid. It's an it's a system that isn't. It's a filtering it, system. It's a filtering system. Thank you. It's, exactly it's, it's, it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a machine, machine run commenting moderation system. Y yes, it's a filtering system. Yeah. Yes, uh, which is a whole separate issue, I think. But surely you're not equating a platform for community as being. Uh, the nature of community. No, I, I, what, what I'm what I'm saying is is it. The, I'm not trying to confuse the platform. What I'm saying is I don't know. What I'm saying is the person I'd love to hear from is the person who has spent two years with that particular community on that particular platform to hear what they would have to say. I was just making the comment that that there's this very large commenting system. I would imagine that somewhere in there there is a community or several communities of people that can be identified. I need to make a correction. There's a tweet in the tweet stream which is inaccurate. Um, I didn't say that Stack Exchange is going to be open source. I said I'm working with Jeff Atwood on a new project which will be open source. It's not oh. Stack Exchange. Please delete your tweet and rewrite it. <laughs> well, probably delete that. You're, be being you're being moderated. You're being moderated from your tweet stream. Yeah. I don't want to say correction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, a new project. New project. This could only happen in an online community meetup. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, to your, to your point. No, anyway, so. Uh, so, um, where, where were we? We were talking about um, healthy communities. But well, we can move on. You, or if Gail has something to say. A tiny little aside. So I haven't spent any time reading Huffington Post as an example, although I know that they're large and contentious. And um, my thought about sites like that is that they um, perhaps a bit like Usenet or other massive mega things that seem like they're not really don't look like a community, is that they do have um, little communities, quite often readers of a particular writer who come back again and again, and the writer knows as well as they know each other. So they're like perfectly, in fact, it's sort of a built-in mini blog context. Yeah. So I, I would be um, very surprised if that's not going on. I just, just don't yeah, yeah. We're thinking about Also, if there's anybody that we wish was in the room so that they could explain our community, we got to invite them to the upcoming unconference, which we haven't even Oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I was waiting for Clea actually was intentionally waiting because she said oh, she was okay. going to drive in and land here at 7. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, there she is. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I didn't even see her. Well, do you want to just take this little commercial break to talk about the unconference, or do you want to wait till after? It's your, it's your call. Sure. I'll say something. 
Okay, we're going to do a commercial break, and um, Claire Hamlin is going to talk about an conference that we are all going to be putting on together. Sorry for being late. An uncommercial commercial. Yeah, sure. Um, I haven't really been that well the last few days, but I rallied to get here because I love the online community. Yay. Um, and I like managing, self-managing communities, so I don't have to do a lot of work. Um, so that's my own preference. Um, I also lead a, a firm called Unconference.net, and we do design and facilitation for professional technical communities and user groups and all sorts of stuff. Um, and back in the day, there was something called the online community unconference, and we want to bring it back. So my firm's going to do the production, and we have some amazing um, sort of anchor tenants leading the... Um, and you all may, help, may or may not have noticed on the sign-in sheet that there was an extra column on uh, our sign-in sheet. We changed it. Exactly changed it. And the column that is new says, are you interested in the online community unconference? And so if you missed it, on the way out, you should go back to your name and check. Yes. <laughs> and then you should interview it. I am. Is there an undate for it? Yes, we were, well, the, the core group of organizers were looking at May. Just so we had lots of time and it wasn't stressful and we could rally everybody from across the country to come. And maybe you should quickly, um, just for the people that don't know, explain what makes an unconference unconference -y. Great. So it means that um, the core content for most of the event is generated by the people there. It doesn't mean you can never have a keynote. It just means you don't spend the whole day listening to talking heads. You spend most of it talking to each other, and the agenda is set the morning of the event by the participants there. The people vote on. People say, I want to um, present on hashtags and create a community around a hashtag, and if lots of people vote on it, then they get to, right? Um, Every session proposed gets to happen. Oh, okay. So people don't really lose their feet as when right. some might be really full. Right, right. But um, you know, we believe that communities of two and three are just as important as communities of a hundred. So can I talk a little bit about it? I'm just saying low, low cost at some point here. Well, so you can talk about the mechanics more. I want to talk about why mm -hmm. uh, a little bit. So a lot of you so if any of you actually attended any of these, these so they're very how many so the minority of people attended these before. That's what that's what I was thinking. Um, um, so these got pretty significant. The last major one in the Bay Area uh, was four years ago, I think, three or four years ago, uh, at the uh, at the History Museum, Computer History Museum, and it had almost 300 attendees from around the world. Um, specifically that it's a practitioner's conference. The point is for us to go in and share what we know and what we've learned with each other. And, by the way, you can go just to consume that information. Right? The, the point is to acknowledge something out loud. And that we there are, might be people in the room who want to know the differences between the CLS and this. So someone other than me should probably talk that because I haven't really been to it. I think I went to one CLS. So, so we'll talk about that in a minute, but let me finish this, this one thing. It, it's acknowledgement that we are a community ourselves. That community managers are our own community in every sense of the word we think about it, is that we support each other, understand what people are doing. So the things you've heard me mention here, for example, metrics. If you're not measuring metrics, and there are people like Mark Smith going there who's going to talk about metrics, you want to run over and, and find out about them. Or find out if you're, you know, right now there's some, a couple of rock arts here. And you can listen to us talk about history and say that was something, or you can go work with someone who's dealing with your problem right now. What uh, is a grog nerd? Oh, uh, sorry, it's a gaming term for old guy who says, Get off my lawn! Uh, <laughs> okay. I don't know that. French for old vet who sits on the porch and screams. That's right. Um, uh, so, without a doubt, I've attended a lot of conferences over my entire career. This has been the most, the unconference associated with this has been the most utilitarian conference I've ever attended in my career period. And I, by the way, I do a lot of things. I do online games, I do I work books on application systems, all this other stuff. Um, I can't wait for this to happen again so much that I've been kicking people to see if we can get it restored. It went away when the sponsoring company decided to stop doing it just when the economy basically collapsed. Uh, what we're wondering is, instead of having just one company sponsor can we do it ourselves? Can we say, gosh, you know, we really need to do this. 
Um, and all I have to do is pay my registration fee and I'm in. Um, and so this is the kind of inaugural post on the message board, which is this call for a conference. So. And you wanted to say something about price or something? I want to say that in the past and uh, hopefully in the future, a really important part about this is that it's affordable so that people who are just thinking about getting into the career can do it, not people, not just people who are being paid for by their companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. And you asked the question, well, how is this different than CLS? CLS West, and actually people are tweeting about CLS West up here. So, so um, I also volunteer, I, I volunteer and help Van with CLS and other folks. It's more rooted in open source community leaders, although all community leaders of all stripes are welcome, and it doesn't have an emphasis on online only. CLS West does not? Yeah. Okay. So it's sort of like your, you know, it came, it used, the, the regular CLS is right beside OzCon. more technical community leaders as opposed to online community managers. You're being asked a question by uh, there. Mm -hmm. So you might want to ask Did they announce me to facilitate this year? Yes, I volunteered to facilitate this year. So I believe I'm doing it. I should check with you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Oh, and and all right. with Identity Woman, at Identity Woman, as you say, right. if you want to tweet at her. And all the women in the audience, you're invited to She's Geeky, which is happening Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. This Friday, Saturday? This Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. What is She's Geeky? It's a women's only technology unconference. My goodness, they don't know. I'm just At the Computer History Museum. It's our favorite venue. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. She was so and she drove about the day just to do this, so appreciate that. Um, I'm aware that we have half an hour left. I want to ask one more question, then I'm going to let you guys ask questions, if that works for you. So, um, and I'm veering off your script, Bill, sorry. Um, but the question that, that I am interested in is, um, what's, what would be, um, obviously, money, no object, your dream tool? What hasn't been invented that you would really like to see in an automated tool-like uh, way. So it's kind of like a little bit like Bill was talking about secret sauce, community secret sauce. But I want to know what would be, if you could, I know what I, what I would make. And I just figured that most of you probably, like, God damn it, how do I have to pay five consultants to do this? So what would be your dream tool? I, the, the thing I would really like to see um, would be really nuanced ways that people who are community leaders and who, or who just decide on one particular day they're going to take some responsibility could uh, really visualize what's happening better. And I think uh, whenever we talk about, about tool building, we, we kind of you know, fall into these things where there's the, you know, the administrator and the, and the co-administrator and the moderator and this sort of little hierarchy. But I would really love to be able to provide uh, ways for somebody who just is, wants to build a conversation up for a day to see who's urgently waiting for to have their, their question answered and who doesn't really care and the sort of subtleties that you can sometimes pick up in face-to-face -face gatherings by just looking at people and listening to them and they're harder to get in uh, text form. Wow. Um, I actually don't think I've ever thought about this before. Um, I don't know if there's a particular like special need. sauce need that I have. Um, the communities that, and I'm speaking from my own personal experience, the communities that I tend to tend to um, are, are small and they're very purpose built and they're highly vetted and everyone's there for a reason. And we take a lot of care designing it. So that's my new kick, it's like community design because you want to design it so that magic happens and so that people are incentivized in the right ways and they're priorities are aligned and their value systems and really getting like the good stuff out of people's head, like the tacit knowledge that's there that trust, only trust enables to come out. Uh, so I've, I've really been obsessed with design because that I think that makes sort of like the moderation and everything else easier. Um, so from my point of view, uh, it's, it's still very human. It's very, one people would say it probably doesn't scale well. Uh, but that's the type of community that, that I'm into, so it's just my POV 
doesn't reflect that of my employer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if money is no object, uh, I don't have a single tool. What I would really like to be able to do is gather people who understand people, are us, anthropologists, sociologists, linguists, visual artists, and start from scratch on a number of communication tools that we have. Mm. And throw, just throw everything out, because I think that there's some of what we're carrying is baggage that dates way back to the 70s, mm -hmm. to this old system and this old method. And we're stuck in it, and it just gets added on and added on. And I still haven't seen anything radically new that makes me go, this really takes into account how people want to collaborate with each other. You know, uh, and if I'm wrong and somebody says, hey, there's this little tool that nobody's been talking about, that would be great. Um, but that's really what I would like to be able to do. I would like to see more social people having an influence on the technology itself. To Maria's point, I strongly feel that um, design and interface and functionality can really influence how we how we interact and how we behave. And I've used that. I've, I've used design to either encourage or discourage certain kinds of things. Um, but I'd like to start over. I'd like to just tear it all apart and start over. I actually have a very, very long improved list. Uh, and I'm working on it as fast as I can. Uh, but I only can advise so many companies at once. Um, but I can, I can I can sum all of it up in community should just be integrated with how everything works. So that it doesn't matter if it's mobile or whatever. The, the fact we're still going to sites to talk about things is kind of weird to me. Twitter kind of showed, we've seen hints of all this. Twitter showed that people could talk about things independent of the technology. It just happens to be a site called Twitter. It's like, well, I have to go to Twitter. but. No, I don't. I, I, I want to embed it in my experience. So whether I'm a company and I want to get my Twitter stream, which I can get through a, a widget, or I'm a user, right now I, I still don't have a single tool. I have multiple clients for reading message boards. This is like incredibly stupid. The threads are all the same. The technology is slightly different. There's fundamental glue missing, which when it goes, when you fix that, will fundamentally change everything. If you want the evidence, the iPhone kind of showed as soon as you put a real computer in someone's pocket, it fundamentally changes everything. That, that real time line of everything just got interesting again, right? Because now you can do almost real time stuff with people. So you can play words with friends even though it's asynchronous, it plays like it's real time, right? So there's, why, why are my message boards still crap? I have to load a stupid app, click on which board I want to go, I have to go to my, grab each individual thread. It's like, what? I wrote this thread. I'm the I'm the owner of this thread. Why isn't it just in my stream with everything else? Yeah. Right. And so, in short, deep integration with the web in every way: search tools, uh, community streams. I mean, that's when you're from yeah, I mean, you've got people working on pieces of it, but it's not all glued together, right? And even when it gets glued together, it's proprietary. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, I mean, it, there's also the whole. I mean, the closest to what you're describing, which makes a lot of sense to me and seems like it kind of aligned with my thinking, is um, the Google Plus situation. But like when I search on Google and I look for Scott Moore, it doesn't just come up Scott Moore, it comes up your Google Plus profile. But the problem is that not all of us are into Google Plus yet. And like, and I actually have, some of us have multiple Google Plus identities, you know, like, I mean, I have my, because of just evolution of our online personas, so I might, TechSoup one, and then I have me, and it's like, oh shit, I don't really, I can't, I don't think I can merge those, even if I wanted to, and it's a big pain, but um, it totally, but it, yeah. It, and then it's critical. Yeah, that whole thing. exactly. I heard this morning that you can merge them. I'm not sure how, I heard that it's complicated, and someone <laughs> at Google in marketing was like, I'll send you how to do it. And then like, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, with the last half hour, we did the networking at the beginning end so that you know, I don't want to be here till midnight. So, um, but I, with the last half hour, I want you guys to ask your questions. We'll and I think we should pass the there. wireless mic yeah, in the audience. And I'm going to bring the, exactly, Scott. Sweet. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring the uh, wired the microphone over to you kids. <laughs> My name is Brian, I'm about one of the dozen consultants in the room, and my question is for uh, Maria. 
But like Yammer, where the nature of your company is to build social networks, and then you have an online community for Yammer employees, and external community, I'm guessing, for Yammer and customers and potential customers. How does what happens in one of those communities affect what happens in the other? Is there overlap? What is your role between the two? So I'm not sure I'm understanding that right. So I'll rephrase or restate the question. Um, are you asking to what extent, like the two sort of internally, or are, are the streams delivered like across communities? Yeah, whatever you can tell me. Whatever you can tell me about them. I'm not sure which one of those that you manage or if you manage both of them. Or so each company has its own community, and that's their like walled garden. Like the whole point is that it's private and secure for your own company. I don't see what goes on in there. Oh, so, the, oh, so there is no, there is no, okay. Yeah, yeah. Saying. And we have just an instance that's an external community where um, we talk to our customers and we have a learning community that's just around education and Yammer. And we have like this myriad of experiences, but they don't really sort of interlink. interlink. Um, and we've just, been good at clarifying sort of the purpose for each community and curating and um, pro like moving people across communities depending on where they are in their customer life cycle. Well, in that case, I just ask a brief follow-up. So the community you manage, is that one uh, site that you're trying to keep everybody at or is that just the ecosystem of what's happening at Yammer on Twitter, what's happening at Yammer on the Facebook page, what's happening at Yammer everywhere? It's all of it. Social and community. Does that help? Yes. Uh, I'm David Spence. Um, I thought it was really interesting to hear the history of community management um, and how they kind of started out as what you described as like a, or I think Scott said as an art, or like a messy art. Um, at what point in that history did you guys really start to see uh, businesses start to come and utilize online communities to reach their goals? And how did that change kind of like the community ecosystem from something that's very natural and artistic to something that's very business and goal driven? Yeah, I'm good answer for that. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think a really interesting thing, uh, there are a lot of businesses that actually legitimately have passionate communities around them and did before any of this technology existed. And uh, a, an example has to do with the history of the well. Some people with well accounts were also deadheads and they realized they wanted to, you know, at that time I was finding out someone else who liked the, the Grateful Dead and especially if you were living away from the Bay Area, it was hard. No one in your, in your private personal life or business life knew what you were talking about. You couldn't go on the road to go to the shows. So they started to organize to get people to sign up in, and be in a forum together. Now, you know, with the Grateful Dead, is a business, whether you think of it that way or not. So would a business like Harley Motorcycles. Obviously, there's a gigantic community around that product. Those things have already existed for some time. And I think in the early days when people gathered for those passions about those um, artists or products or services, it was pretty organic. And what I think was interesting is when, um, when organizations that you couldn't expect would have a lot of passion around them. Um, you know, I started looking at this and figuring out that they actually had subsets of people that were at least interested in, in, in getting the next discount. So I think it's, um, in some ways, I think uh, people who really were legitimate communities led the way. That's, that's my perspective. There was some early, what we now call social media marketing attempts using old school virtual community technologies like a 2D chat program called the Palace. There were guys who paid money to consultants to make the handsome, you know, the boys that used to be boys. Um, palace and a, and a this palace and a this and this kind of community and things like that. So there were numerous marketing experiments for a very long time. Um, and you can, the history of them actually runs right through commercial service like CompuServe and AOL. There's lots of things where you know, marketing people just kind of go out and sell the idea that you could do some online things. Almost never, those, those never really took off to a first approximation. There are probably examples, but I'm not thinking of any. I can think of way more failures than successes. WWF Palace was... Yeah, WWF Palace, do you think that was a success? 
uh, as far as those went, yeah. Okay. Um, but it was just the sheer size. It's because they had they were they yeah. were willing to promote it. Yeah. So basically, if you could run a television commercial, you could get a lot of people to come join you. Uh, that was how it was then. Um, it, everything changed uh, when the social graphs kicked in. Right? So basically, although it was increasing incrementally, Facebook changed everything. And so what we now think of as social media marketing, the thing we have problems differentiating ourselves from, um, uh, <coughs> is really an invention of Facebook, or the age of Facebook, where you can now send things uh, in a targeted way that would get more attention, and therefore you could get the revenue most. Keep in mind, there is one form of this that was successful before. It was something called banner advertisements. Uh, those would, uh, they weren't community themselves, but they could be fostered out uh, on Yahoo groups. Uh, uh, the Yahoo groups associated with things like cancer and other diseases generated orders of magnitude more revenue for the company. So there's a kind of side effect, again, what you're measuring as success is um, Yahoo groups for medical conditions, um, in fact, were the most profitable division in the whole community. So that little subgroup uh, generating more than enough money to pay for the rest of it. So they click on banners? Or? Yeah, they click on ad, ad banners for Medical. The targeted yeah, targeted med medical center. Uh, so what I would add is uh, um, thinking about this, um, support communities um, have been around for quite a while through the services like AOL and CompuServe. Uh, the one that stands out for me was I remember when I started uh, at the virtual world in 1995, um, Toshiba's support community on CompuServe was, um, was getting highlighted as the fact that it was a functional self-supporting um, uh, community. Uh, I, I, my take on it is that uh, I think that as far as for business, that part of it was also as uh, e-commerce got better and more trusted, that businesses started to move online and as businesses started to move online, then, then they saw these tools that could bring them around, yeah. um, that they could carry with them. I think hardware companies are a really good example of early successes. Yep. There's one right there. So um, I'm a big fan of the concept of how you define a member's identity in a community it goes a long way towards determining their behavior in the community and consequently a lot of the emergent things you see from communities. So I'm curious to, to know how you will think that individual identity will be defined in future on the net. We've had anonymous communities, we've had pseudonymous communities, we've had people being defined by their Facebook IDs, we've had various posts from governments to have national ID cards, and given the increasing problems of the net, I'm certain that if any of those get implemented, they're going to be used on the net at some point. The identity woman has to so, answer. Yeah, we're going to just hand this over to you later. Sorry. Yeah. She'll explode if she doesn't talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was just looking for this no, something else tackling this question. I've been doing it for 10 years. Um, I think it's going to stay diverse. So 4chan isn't going away, which is like super anonymous. And people with their handles that they've had for 5, 10, 20, 40 years aren't going to give up their handles. And you're going to see the emergence of more ways that people can prove verified attributes about themselves, but not necessarily who they are. Yes, I have a degree in environmental oceanography, and this is my opinion about environmental problem X, but you're not going to figure out which one of the, whatever, 5,000 people with that degree I am. I'm not going to tell you, but you can prove that little piece about yourself. So that's you can verify the anonymity. Maybe, hopefully, starting margin. I'm on the management council of the steering committee of the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, which is tackling this whole giant set of things, including how we prove who we are when we want to, to government agencies and like the folks who collect our taxes or we get our social security from, like not, this is not evil NSA stuff, it's just like we're people in a bureaucratic society that need to exchange some paperwork online kind of stuff. So if you want to hang out with me and NSTIC, I invite you. It's a 100% open forum, anybody can join. Where's the URL? 
Um, IVEcosystem.org is where you join. Julia, I'll have to jump in on this. Um, our, there are so many companies that are collecting and assimilating little bits of information behind the scenes, and there's a whole economy behind that. Whether we want to give up um, that information, if we keep it segmented, the, the borders are such that links are, are crossing over the walls and it's all getting reintegrated behind the scenes anyway. That was a question I was going to have about the various communities that people are involved in. Aren't the businesses <clears throat> trying to establish a common identity for individuals when they move from support community to the advocacy community to, to various things? So isn't the cat out of the bag a little bit? So this is my opinion only because it's going to be opinionated. Um, I think that what's going on is, yes, that's happening. Having had a chance to peek behind one of the kimonos at one point, um, that is valuable business information, and they don't like sharing it. So that becomes advantageous business information. So I think that um, yes and no, but it's going to wind. I mean, if I was if I was a business and I was collecting all this information, I wouldn't necessarily just hand it out to people. But there are companies selling. I'm sorry. Aren't there companies selling? There are yeah, there are companies selling it, but I think that that companies that are fine that are gathering large amounts of data. Like for example, actually, you can't sell it. You can only sell it in aggregate. Yeah, well, it depends on what you've agreed to in a privacy policy. Yeah, yeah and most privacy policies will only do it in aggregate. Yeah, but but um, I've had reason to look at a lot of privacy policies. <laughs> yeah, uh, all the ones you care about can't. They only sell it in aggregate. Yeah, uh, but even then, it, it, um, I mean, the the ability to build up a profile of an individual is amazing. But from my experience, the companies that are doing that have absolutely no interest in sharing information. What they want to do is they want to share uh, uh, filtered access to advertisers. So I can deliver to you, like Facebook, I can deliver to you a 24-year-old man who's just graduated college and has two cats. You know, that's what they'll sell to you, but the rest of the information... They won't tell you who. They won't tell you who necessarily... I mean, yeah, well, they'll tell you who enough no, they won't. Oh, no, I'm sorry. They'll say they'll, they'll say it's it's his profile and they'll deliver it. Right. Yeah. So Mike needs to come over here. These people have been waiting for us. Okay, good. Me? Um, this is a question of the panel, maybe particularly you, Maria. Um, when you were talking about that sweet spot of, of community design and where the magic begins to happen, and um, I'm really interested in learning the lessons of incentivizing participation in a community via the right strategy and the right community design. The context here is um, I work for a nonprofit network of cities and counties doing sustainability work. And uh, we want to start by building an answers community. Um, these professionals have tons of technical questions, but they're very busy. They're not just going to come here and start um, using it, so we've got to get it right. And um, you know, if that works, then maybe we'll expand this platform to have city profiles, and where you're starting to ask things of people, but I think they have to really get something out of it before you start going there. So can you share some, some big lessons? Um, you know, I think I have some basic understanding of things. I've talked with Badgeville about their gamification techniques. Oh. But, um, <laughs> not going to go with that. Nonprofits can't afford Badgeville, but um, um, seems like some of the things they do are great. Some of the things that they're doing are things that I'd want to mimic. But just any thoughts on the getting this right, getting people to come and, and participate? I know it's a really broad, basic question, but um, I'm in one on one phase, so I'm asking them. That's the million dollar question, <laughs> the one that I ask myself every day. Ultimately, it comes down to not gamification. It comes down to uh, really creating an environment of trust. So you're not going to have anything if people don't trust each other. And so there are lots of like moving pieces, like there has to be betting, there has to be, you know, a, a usage policy that, you know, sort of doesn't handcuff people, but sets like the right tone. Uh, I always encourage communities to start small so that these founding members who are 
um, aligned with you and sort of the purpose of the community can form these best practices and these behaviors and form the culture because everyone that comes after will mimic Right, they're not gonna like look at you know your policy. It, it's the guardrails, but whatever. Uh, they're gonna look at the behaviors that already exist. So how you sort of approach your initial uh, phase is really critical, and that's where a culture gets built, and then it gets passed on, and these artifacts get passed on. Um, and I think uh, as far as <laughs> just one thing, incentivizing people to participate, it's it's not gamification, it's not the number of posts. It's really fundamentally getting down to like the human element of what's in it for me. And I make it a point to get to know all the members that come into our community. It gets hard, we're scaling and we're scaling fast, uh, but figuring out like how we can figure out what's in it for the different people and the different groups of people. Um, because until people have a reason to, and they could be different, like they wanna be the thought leaders they want to um, learn more. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just aligning like the right behaviors with the right, um, the carrots with the, carrots with the sticks or whatever, carrot with the bunny, um, mm -hmm. to, to elicit those be I mean, it's just sort of human psychology. Like mm -hmm. the online element is new, but I, I think the behavior is not new. It's sort of like the same thing that we're doing now. What is our incentive to come to this room for us to talk, for for you guys to ask questions, for you to share, for us to listen. What what is it all about? Like, what is our collective sort of goal and collective consciousness, and our individual goal as participants? And that's hard. There's no tool that's going to automate that. So I'm going to just speak that speak specifically to the whole Q and A thing because I spent two years at Answers.com and and worked with a couple other things, and it it's hard. And I, I, I literally just spent a day with a client yesterday saying, a nonprofit saying, don't do Q&A. Focus on what's going on first because, um, now this was only within a particular type of community, which I don't want to get into, but, but Q&A behavior was a percentage of the overall interaction that was going on. And, and focusing on that meant that you're, you're subdividing the potential interaction even further and further. Um, and we can talk about that specifically, but what I want to do is I want to hand this over to the person who has written a book on reputation systems <laughs> and gamification and badging and what, what can be automated. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's me. Um, and so the good news is you can read this book, uh, draft, the second to last draft of the book for free on the web. So if you go to buildingreputation.com and click on the little thing that says wiki, um, you can see the wiki version of the book. Uh, go to chapter five. Chapter five describes how you build a community site, um, and specifically three questions of which I think Maria said two. She phrased them differently. She had two of the three. Um, so th this is hard, hard fought stuff, and other designers have done this. Another thing I recommend is to find yourself an affordable, experienced consultant to take you through the process. Uh, I know that I'm a consultant. I'm probably not affordable for you, but um, there are several in the room who might be. Um, specifically. The experience, you'll see it when you read chapter five of the book and say, oh, uh, these are important questions and I can answer them, but I'm realizing I've got big gaps because it leaves lots of opens, options open. And you've heard me mention context over and over and over, but chapter one of my book is only about context. Um, and if you get the context wrong, you can destroy any chance you have of any success. So having someone who can kind of walk you through that, even if just for a day, uh, will will save you a fortune in throwing away technology choices. If you're jumping all the way, Scott's point about don't do Q, you might want to do QA is spot on the mark. If you're talking about the tool before you understand what they're going to do, you've done it in the wrong order. So, so I tell all my clients that they say, let's do stars, let's do this, let's do leaderboard. Let's, oh, wait, stop. What is it you want to accomplish? Right. And, and I just want to yeah. also check in that. Um, I'm happy to talk to you. I launched the TechSoup forums 12 years ago, and they are a Q&A forum. Tech questions, experts answer them. I had to find the experts. I found them in the community itself because they bubbled up by answering questions when I launched it. I can talk to you all about it because I grew one that 12 years later is still very active. And if, if Randy talks about um, you know an average healthy community being 200 active users, we have um, probably three to 400 active answerers there every day, and so I mean, and that's with you know many, many more 
hundreds more, <laughs> hundreds of thousands more visits. But still, I'm happy to talk to you about what I did. I made it up as I went along, and it was successful. So I mean, I'm happy to talk yeah. to you. And it's a nonprofit. Yeah. We can have coffee. Okay. Thank you. I'm kind of. Is this one? I'm, I don't think it is one. It's off. Ah, well, turn it on. <laughs> no, now you turn it off. It says on and off on the button. Can you go look? I can like, speak loud. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a trainer. So, my question is this. I have um, kind of been new in this community and trying to find out, you know, what community management positions or what I thought a community management position was. And what I'm coming up with and seeing in the market, as you are alluded to a little bit before, is that what businesses are hiring for when they post community manager is really social media marketing. And so um, my question is kind of this, to the, the profession of community management, is it time that we start to define what is a community manager, what is social media marketing, where does product evangelism come in, that there's a difference between creating a community for um, you know, technical support versus product adoption, and where are the differences and where are the similarities? Um, so I'm just so, interested in your so uh, observation. I, I think, think you just wrote the category for your unconference. Yeah. You <laughs> sounded exactly like someone oh, who Come to my session on your conference. So by the way, if you do that, I'll be there. Yeah, that was yeah. Really um, Okay. Uh, no, way, no way we can actually unpack I'll that here. It. But that's, huh. that is, in fact, one of the reasons I think we did an unconference is so that we can start at least amongst ourselves to come up with some definitions. Even if we can't promulgate them anywhere else, at least we can talk to ourselves about it. But um, then we can produce blog posts and position statements that we can share with the greater community. Um, there is, in fact, um, the Community Roundtable group has produced a paper. Every year they produce an annual report. So you go to communityroundtable.org. Oh, what's the? It's community-roundtable.com. Um, they try to tackle this kind of in a print form and a big thing, um, but that's not the same as kind of consensing us together amongst ourselves. So um, I, I, I think it's really important. So there's an interesting subtlety, specifically in terms of finding a job, interview for the job of the social media marketer, tell them what you know how to do, right? Uh, upsell the added value. Don't, you know, they, they're thinking you're just going to tweet. You probably don't want the job because you're not going to succeed. No one, I've never heard of any community working successfully only because they post Twitter posts. In fact, what I've heard of is more train wrecks. Yes. Some really big, well-known names have had huge train wrecks because all they did was Twitter things, and as a result, they Twittered too much and said inaccurate things and got in big trouble. That's right. Um, uh, if it's part of a bigger strategy. So, you know, uh, regardless of where we come when we come to a conclusion, um, bringing, you know, bringing the strategy level up, saying, hey, wait, this is really about fostering relationships. And that's been around since the Clue Train Manifesto written by Doc Searles and, and the other guys. Um, you know, if you have, it, it, just, just to feel a little better, read the Clue Train Manifesto. It's short. It's on the web. Anyone else want to come? We have time for probably one more question from the audience. All right. And I also want to tell you, is anyone from the online asking questions on the chat? Uh, I have not okay. seen any. I'm okay. not yeah. So I guess they've been asking the Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Building, building reputation. Building and name of the book is uh, Building Web Reputation Systems from O'Reilly. Okay. If you type any of that in, you'll find it. Thank you. So, um, Zach. Yes, yeah, so this mic's actually dead. So if you want to ask a question, just speak up really loud. Okay. It, the mic is dead. Uh, it's sense? just about very loud. Ah, okay. That makes sense. That's why it was working. I just had a quick question about the lights. No, no. <laughs> it's on time. Okay. So, right here. Okay. Um, this is just a quick question about you were mentioning a mechanized automated commenting system, and I missed the name of it. Oh, uh, didn't somebody go scroll through right there? Uh, actually, there's a link up there. It's called Julia. The internal name for it is called Julia. And that's an acronym. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have to um, it, It's just like it's just a uh, something about a, a user ling lingua whatever. It's something having to do with language, but it's um, the woman who founded it. Her name is Elena Halliser. 
E L E N A H A L I C Z E R. You can find her on LinkedIn, and she created, she invented the tool. Huffington Post bought it and her, and um, with you know when they bought it, they brought her on board. And there's tons and tons written about it and her. Thank you. Um, any questions? One more question? Go. <laughs> Do um, it. This is mostly, I guess, for, for Maria. It's a question about stakeholders in online communities. Um, at Yammer, very often the online communities you have have a real world corollary. Meaning, if you don't answer my Yammer post, I can bang on your cubicle wall. Um, and so there is sort of a if you duck the thing I signed you on Yammer, you will have the awkward moment in the elevator, right? But but at the same time, you not every person in a the community, there are Yammer communities for companies that are quite large and are distributed. Um, so my, my, my larger question is, how do you credential um, stakeholders? How do you create stakeholders? Um, and how do you address, how, how, does, how does one address different levels of engagement among people who we're going to see each other at lunch and we'll continue this conversation versus we only interact with you on this digital forum and, and what can one do as a community moderator and manager to ensure that everyone feels as though they get to sit at the cool kids table even though some kids some people literally are sitting at the cafeteria table yeah. so I, I think it's sort of like a new frontier like which we, we try to blend or encourage our, actually our customers to blend. And actually, we run uh, the Microsoft Yammer community, which has like 100,000 people in it. It's huge. Uh, and so, you know, if we're still like writing the book, uh, quote unquote, on like what that actually means and how that works. Um, I think it, it really depends on your organizational context. Like, blending online and offline, I think, is very, very powerful. So like for, for example, this is just an example, you may have an um, all hands town hall like in, in an internal context. Why not supplement that with a digital you know, um, aspect element? That way people who are not right there in person can also participate. Um, and definitely there is, there's a ton of blending of like, hey, you know, I saw you speak about this, you know, let's talk about it di digitally and vice versa, like to your point, I saw you in the elevator after we talked. It actually brings people closer together because sometimes, I, I can't imagine like how many times I've, I've heard this story. I had a question, I didn't know where to go, I put it on Yammer, someone answered, and that person sat two, two cubicles from me. So, you know, physical proximity does not necessarily mean that people are going to find each other. Um, so I, I really feel like it, it's sort of um, it's it's evolving, and, and um, different companies approach it differently. You know, proximity has a has a role. Physical sort of touch and feel has a role, but uh, digital is shrinking the, the world also. Does that answer at all? So this isn't about Yammer, but it's about intranets in general, and specifically large companies. I was for five better part of five years. I was at Yahoo, and uh, Yahoo had an internal intranet, and they chose a wiki as their primary um, store for document technology for uh, collaboration. Um, so it, it turns out you need to optimize for something other than real-time face-to-face, because when you're coming up like Yahoo, you are in 24 time zones simultaneously. Um, so it's, we're never gonna have lunch together if you're on my Nicola team, unless I go there or the whole team comes here. Whole team's not coming here, so maybe I'll get out there, maybe I won't, because it's expensive. Um, um, but there were some interesting hooks, and I don't know about how Yammer works internally. I've never used it in an internet. But um, there's some amazing stuff you can do socially. Um, there was a plugin done by one of the founders of Flickr. The first thing, that, one of the first things he did was he created a plugin for our wiki that would just simply show the profile pictures and names of people who had visited this page and went. Now, when you're talking about putting a specification on board and sending an email telling everyone, here's a link to the spec, no one takes the time to respond to the spec. But it was really great that I knew that the head of the product team and the head engineer had both seen it 
and actually visited the page. Turned the, so little flags are just as, you know, way more powerful than any, like, we're going to talk about it more. It's like, I know you saw it. It's like this automatic contract fulfillment. So there's a bit of technology that's possible. Uh, now it turns out Yahoo pulled it um, uh, because of privacy. They said that employees had privacy. You, you, them re you reading their some page and telling some of their employees somehow violated their privacy, uh, which is absurd. But anyway, that's the kind of company Yahoo was. Um, but intranets are very special. And I think the interesting relationship, you touched one, but the actually more interesting relationship is between the users and the, which are employees of the company and the company. One of the reasons intranets are so special is people behave because they can lose their job. Right? So t kind of turning around and realizing that you have these social tools I don't, I don't actually, I don't care. I never cared if I was hanging out with the cool kids. What I cared most of all is that the people who needed to know about this thing knew about it, and that um, it, they could edit it or whatever the you know whatever the technology enabled. You know, the wiki. It's like uh, knowing who saw it and who edited it and what the edits were was gold. Um, to a first approximation, if we ever met and talked about it in person, that's just an inefficiency and bandwidth thing. And uh, the thing things changed since then is Skype. I mean, so. Gosh, if you want to talk, let's just talk. Uh, so deep integration with tools. That's it, it, more important in intranets than even in public Yeah, so I think you alluded to, to a key point that your motivation to participate in the answer are very different, like depending right. on are you with your coworkers, does my boss see me? And so people do behave. Yeah, knowing your boss saw it was really good too. <laughs> something, um, something that I've seen work really well, uh, not necessarily in a work environment, but can work in a work environment as well, is in any workplace there are people who in fact want to be more cool, they want to have a better reputation in the business, they want, they want to be seen, and it's not everybody, some people really like to you know, not be seen, but there are people who would really like to have someone else ask them five interesting questions. I mean, not just five formulaic questions, but really just have a short interview and make it available for other people. And that's sort of a structure, which is a game, but it's not gamification or badging, but it's actually like a little way that two people can, you know, interact and, and do something that's actually service to, uh, to everybody, because they can learn at things they don't know about, about one of the members. And I think little, if you think about some of these kinds of old social interactions that are icebreakers from face-to-face -face groups that have gone on forever, a lot of them work really well, and they're simple, and they really make people feel good. And I think making people feel good because they've actually been heard is the best way to get them to buy in, just the best. Well, with, that was a totally great feel-good round off. <laughs> and, and, um, with that, I want to thank everyone for coming. And again, um, thank you especially to my volunteers. I put their names up here, um, their, their Twitter handles. And it's Matt Fairchild, Susan Chavez, the Time Doctor, and the Zach, who did our live stream, which went without a hitch. It's amazing. Mark Siegel and uh, Robbie out there. And um, everyone, thank you so much for coming. Check out the box if you're interested in the end conference and the signature on the sign of sheet, please do so. And uh, meetup.com slash OC try to sign up for the meetup group so you can get ready for the next one. And thank you guys. Keep the conversation going on the hashtag, hashtag between meetups. Thank you so much. Good night.